Ladies and gentlemen, you'll never guess what was hidden in this home. We are back with Mr. Ballin. Oh man, this is actually a shorter, shorter video than what I've normally seen from him. Uh, I'm just like <laughs> trying to prepare myself because you know, with his storytelling, man, the way he brings you in and then I'm looking at this thumbnail just to build up to this again appreciate y'all coming over shout out to all the good humans shout out to this brother make sure y'all subscribe to his channel because he's incredible we ain't gonna waste no more time let's jump right into it a large strange device was discovered inside of the secret room in northern england in 2002 and today i'm going to share the awful truth behind it but before we get into today's story if you're a fan of the strange dark and mysterious delivered in story he format already, then you come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once or twice every week so if that's of interest to you please sneak into the like buttons house the day before their wedding and replace their dress shoes with crocs also please subscribe <laughs> to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads all right let's get into today's story they still gonna rock them crocs to the wedding <laughs> At the end of 2002, 36-year-old Boyd Taylor was single, he had no children, and he lived with his divorced father, Robert, in a small bungalow in the northern England countryside. In addition to living with his father, Boyd also worked for his father. His father, Robert, owned a small construction business, and so the father-son duo built houses in the area. While Boyd might have envisioned his life turning out in a different, more exciting way, he didn't seem outwardly unhappy about his circumstances. In fact, he seemed very cheerful, both at work and when he was at home. But despite his cheerfulness, his father, Robert, was still pretty concerned about him. Because every time Boyd had some time off from work and was just at loose ends, he wouldn't go out with his friends. In fact, he really didn't have any friends and wasn't even trying to make any friends. Instead, he would just sit in his room all day and be totally by himself. Now, Robert knew his son was naturally a bit of a loner and always had been, but a part of him hoped that his son would just start going out and meeting new people, or at the very least, develop some sort of hobby that could occupy his mind. Right. In late September of 2002, Robert was walking down the hallway of their bungalow when he passed by his son's bedroom door, and it was shut, and as he walked past, he heard inside of his son's room the sound of his son sawing some wood. And so he stopped for a second and he just listened. And when the sawing stopped for a second, Robert just knocked on the door. He was curious. He wanted to know what his son was doing. Boyd, instead of coming over to the door and opening it up and talking to his dad, instead just paused for a second and then said, you know, what is it, dad? What do you... <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I got I, I got my headphones on. I could, I could literally hear my heart beating because <laughs> I'm just waiting. <laughs> Because I know something crazy is coming, man. My damn heart. Oh. I'm like, I was like, can y'all hear that? And Robert just knocked on the door. He was curious. He wanted to know what his son was doing. Boyd, instead of coming over to the door and opening it up and talking to his dad, instead just paused for a second and then said, you know, what is it, dad? What do you need? And Robert would say, well, I heard sawing and I just wanted to know what you were building. And so Boyd pauses again and then just says, well, I'm working on a woodworking project. And so Robert's like, well, can I poke my head in and actually see what you're building? And Boyd, again, without opening the door, just tells his dad very politely that he wants to be left alone. Mm. And so Robert decides not to push the issue. Whatever he was doing, it was his business. And so he just told his son that, you know, hey, if you need any help with anything, let me know. I'd be glad to help. And then Robert walked away. Over the next two months, every time Boyd was not working, so in the evenings and on the weekend, he would be locked inside of his bedroom, hammering and sawing away at this woodworking project. And over those two months, Robert would periodically walk down the hall and stand in front of his son's bedroom and knock on the door and try to get his son to let him in to just see what he was up to, not only because he just wanted to see what his son was doing, but because Robert was a carpenter by trade and so was just genuinely interested. But every time he asked to be let in, Boyd would very politely tell his father that he really just wants to be left alone, and Robert respected his wishes. In early December, Boyd approached his father and said, hey, you know, what 
be possible for me to take the next month off from work so I can focus on this woodworking project. Now, for Robert, this was a massive inconvenience. This construction business that he owned was really just he and his son building the houses. And so if his son was not going to be working, then Robert would be solo on all of his projects for that month. But Robert's thinking to himself, you know, my son has finally found a hobby that he's really into. I don't really know what it is, but clearly he's invested in it. And so he tells his son, you know what? That's fine. You take the whole month. And if you want more time in January. With all the stuff that you hear, all the stories you hear about, you know, people saying, you know, parents, you need to make sure you check on your kids when they're in their room, if they got their, you know, you make sure they ain't trying to build a bomb, just all that type of stuff. Like, I understand he found a hobby and his father's happy, but at the same time, I'm like, man, what you making? I need to know. I need to know before you go on with, especially if you're talking about taking a month off, tell me now what you're making. Don't lie to me. You know what I mean? That's tough. Well, my son has finally found a hobby that he's really into. I don't really know what it is, but clearly he's invested in it. And so he tells his son, you know what? That's fine. You take the whole month. And if you want more time in January, that's fine. You just let me know. So starting that first week All in right. December, every time Robert would leave the house to go to work in the morning, he would leave to the sound of Boyd in his bedroom, hammering and sawing and tinkering away at his woodworking project. And then several hours later, when Robert finally came back home, he'd walk into the house. And the first thing he would hear is his son still in his bedroom, still hammering and sawing away. When December finally ended and Robert expected his son to be done with his project and to finally show him what he's been working on, Boyd approached him and said, well, dad, I'm not quite done with the project. I need about two more weeks. And so Robert said, no problem. We'll talk in two weeks. So December rolled into January and Boyd just continued to work all day long inside of his bedroom. Then on the evening of January 7th, Robert was home. He was watching TV in the living room and Boyd was hard at work in his bedroom right down the hall when Robert Robert decided he was tired and he was going to go to bed. So he stands up, turns the TV off. He leaves the living room. He goes down the hallway with his son's room on the right. And as he passed, he can hear his son at work and he kind of yells to his son that he's going to bed. And then Robert goes into his bedroom, crawls into his bed and falls asleep. At 3.30 a.m. the following morning, Robert is suddenly awoken by this incredibly loud crashing sound somewhere in his house. Robert's first thought was the chimney must have collapsed. That was how loud the sound was. And so he leaps out of his bed, he runs out of his door, he goes down the hallway, past his son's room, into the living room, and he looks at the fireplace, which is in the TV room, and clearly the chimney has not collapsed onto itself. And so he's standing there thinking, you know, what else could that sound have been? And then he's thinking to himself, well, did I really hear that sound or was that sound in my dream? And I kind of thought it was real, but it really wasn't. I've and so just to before. be sure, he walked all around the house, kind of seeing if there were any signs of something big falling and crashing on the ground, but the house seemed totally in order. And so he walked back down the hallway towards his bedroom and he stopped right outside of his son's room and he considered knocking and waking his son up to see if maybe he had heard this loud sound too. But when he listened to the door, it was quiet inside. So he figured, you know what? My son's asleep. I'm not going to wake him up for this. And so Robert just went into his bedroom and he went back to sleep. A few hours later, Robert got up and he left his bedroom. He went into the kitchen and he made himself some food. And as he's preparing his food, he's realizing that he doesn't hear the sound of Boyd working in his bedroom bedroom because normally Boyd would be working that early in the morning, but he wasn't. And so right before Robert left to go to work that day, he actually walked down the hall and listened to his son's bedroom to hear if maybe he was at work in there, but he just hadn't heard him, but it was totally silent in the room. And so he reached down to the doorknob <sighs> thinking maybe he could just poke his head in and see if his son was on his bed. But when he tried the doorknob, it was locked. So Robert just thought to himself, okay, I guess Boyd is sleeping in this morning. And so I'm not going to bother him. And so Robert leaves the house, he gets into his truck and he drives off to work. And then several hours later, he comes back to the house at night and he walks inside. And the first thing he hears is nothing. It's silent. And this house in the evenings for the past several months was never quiet. Boyd was always hammering, sawing and tinkering away at this woodworking project. And so right away, Robert's thinking to himself, 
maybe he's done with the project and I can finally see this thing he's been working on. And so Robert drops his stuff at the door and he walks down the hallway. He goes to his son's bedroom door and he knocks and he says, hey, Boyd, are you done with your project? Oh, but he's knocking. met with silence. And so Robert reaches down again and tries the doorknob, but it's locked. And so Robert's standing there thinking, you know, it's too early for him to be asleep. And so he yells out for Boyd, you know, hey, what's going on? Where are you? I haven't seen you today. Come out here. Come talk to me. But again, it's silent. And so Robert's thinking, okay, well, when I pulled in, was his car in the driveway and he can't remember. And so he leaves the house. He goes out to the driveway and sure enough, there's Boyd's car. It's in the driveway. So he has to be here. And so suddenly Robert's starting to feel a little bit panicked about his son. He runs back into the house and he just starts screaming his son's name as he goes room to room into the bathrooms and the other bedrooms to see if he's in there, but he's nowhere to be found. And so operating on a gut instinct, Robert just runs right out to his car. He gets a sledgehammer, comes back in the house, goes down the hallway, and he's standing in front of his son's bedroom door. And one more time, he yells for his son and bangs on the door, tries to get his son's attention. But after once again, there being total silence, he picks up his sledgehammer and begins breaking the door down. Yeah. And after a couple of swings, he manages to pop off the locking mechanism, the actual doorknob. That gets blown off and he can push the door open and he sees inside the bedroom is empty. There's just a bed and a dresser and there's no Boyd. But in the back right corner of the room where normally there was like this alcove, basically a segment of his room kind of jutted away from the rest of the space, almost like it was a closet, but with no door on it. Boyd had clearly built a wall and door over that alcove, kind of creating a sort of sub room within his bedroom. And this door was shut. And so Robert... Is that... Just trying to prepare myself again. It's just crazy hearing this story go on about him having to bust the door down and the, and the doors locked, and he went from door to door, but that one was locked. Ah. Uh a wall and door over that alcove, kind of creating a sort of sub room within his bedroom. And this door was Ooh. shut. And so Robert immediately runs over to this new second door. He tries the doorknob. It's locked. He yells for his son. But again, after silence, he picks the sledge up and begins trying to break this door down. And after a few good swings, like the first door, he was able to knock the doorknob off of the door. And then he reached down and he pulled the door open. And what he saw on the other side of the oh. store inside of this little sub room was so far from anything he ever expected that he just stood there in stunned silence and then eventually reality kind of kicked back in and he ran out of his son's room and he called the police three months earlier boyd had decided he wanted to build this very specific device that was invented in 1789 now he didn't want his father to know about this device and so he built that door and wall frame in front of that alcove specifically so he could build this device inside of this new sub room in privacy. He also always made sure to lock his main bedroom door. So for three months, Boyd began constructing this eight foot tall, three foot wide structure inside of the subroom. And once the shell of this device was constructed, he began installing all of its inner workings. These included things like various lengths of wire and clock timers and a jigsaw, which is like an electric saw. And then finally on January 7th, it was complete. So that night, Boyd blew up an air mattress and he slid it inside of the subroom right underneath this ancient machine he had built. And then after that, he went and locked the main bedroom door. He went into the subroom himself and shut the subroom door and locked that. And then he pulled 12 sleeping pills out of his pocket, swallowed those, and then laid down on this air mattress on his back, looking up at the inner workings of this machine. And then once he was positioned the way he wanted to, he reached over up inside of this machine and he felt around for a button that he had placed. He pressed that button and then he put his hands over his chest and he laid there looking straight up until the sleeping pills kicked in and he fell asleep. That button he pressed right before he passed out from the sleeping pills started a timer and when that timer went off, it would actually activate this whole device. And so several hours after pressing that button, the timer finally went off at 3.30 a.m. The first thing that happened when this device was activated is the jigsaw, the electric saw, began sawing this wire. Now the wire had been very intentionally placed against the 
the teeth of this jigsaw. And so it's cutting this wire and this wire is supporting this weighted down heavy angular blade that's pointing straight down. And so as soon as this wire is cut, it releases the blade and the blade that almost looks like this oversized ax head begins falling straight down the chute and the chute aims the blade directly onto the front of Boyd's throat. Boyd's woodworking project was a guillotine and that loud crashing sound that woke Robert up at 3.30 in the morning on January 8th, that was the sound of the blade of this guillotine crashing down and decapitating his son. Even though Boyd did not leave behind a note explaining his actions, it was determined Boyd's death was in fact a suicide, a very complicated and deliberate suicide. Boyd's father and other people involved in this case have come to the conclusion that Boyd was clearly showing signs of depression before he chose to take his own life. And so maybe if Boyd had reached out for help or if there had been some sort of intervention, his death could have been prevented. And if you or anyone you know is struggling with mental health, remember you are not alone. No matter how bad it feels, there are resources out there that can help you. And so I've listed a number of them in the description below. So that's going to do it, guys. If you... Only thing only good thing to come out of this is that he didn't take anyone else's life. You know, it's a lot of people that in the world that feel the way he felt and they go out and before they take their own life. They take others. And, and what sucks is that although the father didn't get in the room earlier to see what was going on, it's like he had his mind made up already. So if it wasn't this way, it probably would have been another way. Wow, that, that, that was crazy. I wasn't expecting, I was more so leaning towards him maybe building something to put his father in. That's what I was thinking. That's what my brain was going to. I didn't, uh, wow. And it's crazy, too, for him to be able to build that. Just think if he would have got help. Like all the positive things he could have did in the world, you know. Because he obviously had a talent to be able to, you know. Wow. All right. Hey, appreciate y'all coming over. Hope you guys enjoyed. I don't know. I mean, it's always crazy to say that. But thanks for watching, man. Shout out to Mr. Ballin. Peace out.